All right. So before we left, uh, we were playing around in GDB. We were doing things like using X to examine memory, right? Here we did uh, X slash 10i in order to look at 10 instructions starting at main. And I'm actually going to go through uh, this little thing. This, so we know this is example two that we're looking at right now. And I want to go through from, uh, yeah, to, to the point where it actually calls stuff. So you'll see that the stack is set up a little differently in GDB. And collected everything over here. <clears throat> so, when we look at this assembly code, doing a sort of, you know, it starts out looking like it normally does, and then we see that, that uh, aligning ESP on a 16-byte uh, boundary, like we sort of talked before, or an address that, you know, is a multiple of 16. So, when we first get into uh, main, you know, we have the address of whoever called main right, right on top of the stack, right? Got to save DIP. Right? And actually, let me go back to the C source code for just one second here. So recall, we're in main right now. And the thing we want to recall about this hmm. is that in example two in main, we have a single local variable, right? So we have only a and we're going to pass like argv into a2i and then we're going to assign that to the result to a, etc. So, going back here, start with our save DIP in the stack, then push our ETP. <clears throat> All right, and now we get to, so, at this point, we have, you know, EVP and ESP are right here. We also have ESP, but just not for very long. So the next instruction we do is and ESP <coughs> with FFFFF0. So right now, inherently, just looking at this assembly code, I don't know if ESP is going to be aligned down or not. I need to know, like, what the actual address in ESP is in order to know whether it's going to go down, whether it's going to stay the same, you know, is it already aligned, that sort of thing. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to back up from uh, what I did initially here. First thing I did was break main, right? I'm going to uh, do it a little differently this time. I'm going to copy the address of the first instruction of main. I'm going to quit this out. I'm going to restart it. And then I'm going to do break star and then that instruction of the first uh, the first actual instruction of main. So this is going to now give me a breakpoint on the pop, uh, the push EBP. So I set that. Now I have two breakpoints. I have one at, you know, nine bytes in, and then I have one at the very beginning. I can do info breakpoints in order to see where my two breakpoints are at the moment. I mean, there are two addresses again. I can delete the first breakpoint if I want. So, delete one, the number of the breakpoint. Do info breakpoints again. Now I have only the breakpoint at the very first uh, instruction of main. <clears throat> now I'm going to run this program. It's going to break at the very first instruction of main. And then I'm going to step through one instruction at a time in order to see the, uh, in order to see the changes that occur. So, I will run. All right, it prints out, you know, some information about what my registers are at the very first instruction, prints out some stuff about the stack, right? And then it's going to push, ten, it's going to print uh, 10 instructions. And now I'm going to be stopped sitting here pointing at this one, right? This little arrow sign right here is, well, equals and greater than sign, but it's an arrow, points at the push EBP saying, this is where I'm stopped right now. But we don't know how to step yet. So we need to find out how to step. All right, so that told us about breakpoints. We had uh, break and B, and you know, if you wanted to give an address of something, you would do B star address. You did info breakpoints, and then I didn't put it on there, but but uh, delete we'll delete the breakpoint. All 
I'm just going to go like this. Good enough. All right. So just as some miscellaneous things that uh, Dave Kepler uh, clued me out to, starting in GDB version 7, you actually have the ability to do reverse stepping. So you can be broken at the first instruction of main, and then you can potentially step backwards. I don't know if that actually works if you break somewhere and you can step backwards. I think it's more like if you step forward a couple instructions, you can step back a couple instructions as well. So I actually haven't played with this yet, but uh, just for your own knowledge, GDB does have the ability to start doing backwards type execution. All right, so you can see those two different things. Um, and then, yeah, I guess I want to say, well, I'll come back to disassemble. All right, so this is sort of that output that we see when we have our, our stuff uh, all of our things that, you know, for ESP and all the registers, et cetera. Uh, just for your own knowledge, um, when you have the source code available and you've compiled it with dash GGDB, it will be able to, you know, correspond certain lines of source code like this printf, you know, will correspond to whatever this uh, assembly lines are right now until you get to, so this printf will keep being displayed until you get to the next C line and then it'll change. So actually if I go look back in my VM, should see that up here, this is my source line that I am right now, right? I'm just stepping through this initial prologue code of a main. I haven't gotten to the first line of main yet where I do A equals A2I of arg V of 1. Right? So right now it's saying, well, you're at the source line this because you're still just uh, stepping around. You haven't gotten to anything real. All right. So then we have the uh, step instructions. So back when we were in Visual Studio, we had our little GUI things where we step into, step over, step out of, things like that. Now uh, we have, you know, specific commands to do each of those. Um, so step I <coughs> is to step uh, one assembly instruction at a time. And so this step I also is always considered like a step into. So if you're on a call instruction and you type step I or SI, it will go to the target of the call. Right, so it will step into that call. <clears throat> and then on the other hand, if you're, you know, trying to debug some source code or something like that and you want to move from one source line to the next, right? Right now we're at a line that says, you know, int main, arg c, arg v. If I did step, that would bring me to the next source code line. That would be the a equals a2i of arg v1. If I did step again, that would bring me to the next source code line. So step is just one source line at a time. But the thing to, um, you definitely want to think of step I is what you want to use when you want to go instruction at a time. Step is what you want to do when you go a source code line at a time. Uh, in reality, if you don't have source code, step will default back to step I, but just use step I basically to separate in your mind. You or until is basically like a step over at the source code level. So, uh, you step over, so it's like go until the next source code line. So it wouldn't go into a call instruction or something like that, or sorry, it wouldn't go into a subroutine. So if I have, you know, if main's calling subroutine, whatever, uh, if I use until, that will not go into that uh, source for uh, subroutine. So you or until is just sort of a step over. And next I or NI is next instruction, so this is the step over instruction. So what we want to, the main things we want to be concerned with, you're probably not going to be doing source code level uh, plugging with GDB that much. So the key ones are step I and next I. That's step into and step over basically. All right, so now we know step into and step over. We go back to this uh, source code, back to this assembly back here. 
right? And we want, we want to find out what ESP is at the time when we hit this instruction. So we're at this instruction right now. When I get to that instruction, I'm just going to step, you know, step over or step into. It doesn't matter for these instructions. Going to just step two instructions. So step by once. I'm at this move, right? And I step by again. And now I will be at this ending of ESP with FFFF0. So then I kind of scroll up here and I want to see, you know, what was my ESP. It looks like my ESP at the time when this occurs is BFFF378. So back up on the board, I'm going to use some literal values. Right now, before I execute this AND instruction, ESP right here is, sorry, not 12s now. This again gets into that uh, notion that different operating systems have their own conventions of where the stack is, right? So if you're seeing BFFFF things, right, that's going to be some sort of stack address. And if you're seeing eight zeros and whatever, then that's going to be some sort of code address, right? So this stuff starting with eight zero, et cetera, find there actually is zero eight zero. It's just dropping the first zero. Things starting with zero eight zero, that's roughly speaking where your code stuff is. And things starting with BF, roughly speaking, where your uh, stack is. So this is BF ending in 378. Right? So now I'm going to do this AND instruction. And I said that, you know, anytime you AND something with zero, it's just going to be zero. So we know that we're ending this part with zero and everything else with ones. So everything that was a one will stay a one. Everything that was a zero will stay a zero. So this all just, you know, goes back down. So, and that, and all it really does is takes off that last nibble and turns it into a zero there. So, what we see is because of that, ESP functionally had eight subtracted from it, right? So ESP, after this instruction, is going to be down by eight. So it's down by eight, but it's, you know, not necessarily, like I said, it's not necessarily trying to store any data there. You know, theoretically, you could use a construct like this to store, to allocate space for data, but in this case, uh, we believe this just to be alignment because the next instruction immediately after that is subtracting hex like our normal way to allocate space. So anyways, uh, ESP went down to here after we do the uh, AND instruction, right? So it went down by 8, so 4, 8. And then immediately after that, we do subtract hex 20 from ESP. So we allocate space here break that up if I want, but ESP is now here. If we wanted, you know, we could think about this. This is EBP minus hex 28 or something like that. But I don't know if this has any bearing, but I'll put it there in case it matters. ESP is not there anymore. This we're going to call padding right here, or we'll call this like aligned space. I don't know how to spell a line. How do you spell a line? A L, is there two L's or one L? One L? Alright. A L N. There's no H's. Align space. Alright, so this right here is kind of, you know, whatever it is. We don't care about this align space. It's just something that happened because of that alignment uh, and all right, and then this is going to be our local variable space, potentially. Well, so, okay, so I won't even say it that way. This is going to be more than our local variable space, right, obviously, because we only have a single int A. Right, so somewhere in here there's an A, and then we don't know what the rest of it is, what the rest of it is yet. So now we're going to walk through the rest of the instructions, see what's going on and why there's this extra space here. All right. So I'm going to step 
over that. That aligns it down. So now we see ESP is 370, right? Ending in 370. Going to step over the next instruction, which subtracts hex 20 from ESP. Right? Now it's down even farther. Now it's 3, uh, 3F350. All right, and so now what do we see next? All right, let's just kind of eyeball this next sequence of instructions. We see something leading up to the call. So we probably have an idea that something is going to be pushing stuff onto the stack for that A2I. Uh, last time we saw this, we were all big into that picture of how do you actually find the argv of one and things like that. So we're probably again have to going to go out and find our argv of one, that address of the string kind of thing. And so if we look at this, what we see is EBP plus C. Okay, what do we know about EBP plus things? What kind of uh, variable is that? Yep, parameter passed into the stack. So here's some sort of thing which parameter passed to the stack of uh, main. Well, we didn't draw it up here yet, but what parameters were passed to the stack on main? So what's immediately above the saved EIP? Eric? argc, argc, which we're just going to assume is 2 here, even though I forgot to give a parameter to this, and so it's going to crash. Well, I'm going to restart it just so that we can actually see the 2 in a register. All right. One, two. Go. Now I'm going to do step I. One, two, three, or so step five and four instructions. Success. So you can actually say I want to do multiple steps. So I did step I four, and now I'm back here at that. So EBP plus C. Right. So well, first I just asked what's that? You know, what's the thing immediately above the save DIP? And uh, Eric said that's RC. That's correct. And what's immediately above that? Katie. What's above argc that's passed into main? Next up is that argv, right? And that argv was like a char star star kind of thing, right? We passed the arguments into main right to left. And we did, it was main of argc space argv, and the argv was like whatever it was. Character pointer pointer. That should be on the other side. Who cares? All right, so this instruction right here, we're going to do EVP plus C. EVP is right here. Plus 4, plus 8, right? We said plus 8 is always the first parameter. Plus C, that's the second parameter. So we're going to get the pointer out of here, and we're going to store it into the EAX register, right? So we said before when I had this picture down lower, argv points up to an array of pointers. And so we knew that like the first element of that array is not what we want. We don't want argv of zero. We want argv of one. So we have to step one into that array. That's kind of that plus four coming up next. But let's just do this. Step I over that. And we'll see what's in EAX. All right. So EAX has what looks like a... Uh, so this is where I said before I've never done this sort of thing, digging into the argv and things like that on... Uh, on Windows, so I didn't know whether, you know, that C, whatever it was, address was anything particularly indicative. But I do know that on Linux, uh, your argv, your argc, and your environment variables and all sorts of other stuff is up just further on the stack. So the kernel puts that stuff, like the environment variables on the stack. Then the kernel puts, like, the arg, the argument vector, and then it puts, you know, the that, things like that. So anyways, we can see that this pointer, which was in, you know, this thing, which was the third thing in here, this pointer to an array of pointers, what was actually inside that memory range was uh, BFF ending in 14. Right, that was what was actually in memory. So that previous instruction was an RM32 form because it had the little uh, parentheses on it. Parentheses around EBP. We do EBP plus C because we've got our nice displacement off to the external to the 
parentheses, but so you take EBP plus C, calculate that as an address. That was the address in there on the stack. And then we go dereference that and grab the memory out of that address, stick it in EAX. That's why EAX is now BFF and EAX. Because right, somewhere up here on the stack, well, there it is. Right, right there, that's argc on my stack. That's argv. That's a, uh, what is that? Saved EIP. That's the saved, and note this saved EIP, it doesn't look like our EIPs, right? Like, that doesn't look like an 80 whatever. This is the saved EIP of the guy who called main. Right, so it's somewhere else in memory. Pretty sure that's the dynamic linker. And then this is like a saved EIP or saved EVP. And then this was like alignment junk. And then there's hex 20. Right, so four times four hex 20 is 32. Well, is that right? Four times. Whatever. All right, anyways. Uh, so the next thing we're going to do, we have the address that was stored in that argv pointer, right? So we have the pointer to that array of pointers. But we don't want to pass argv of 0 into a2i. We're passing argv of 1. So, you know, we're going to step one element into that argv array, right? And so we're just taking eax, which is this 424, and we're adding 4 to it. And then we're storing it back into eax. So it'll turn into, EAX will turn into 428. Step 5. EAX is now ending in 428. <clears throat> and this is what we're saying is argv of 1, which should be a pointer. It's a character pointer which points at some string, right? It's the parameter we passed in. Now, if we want to examine that memory with GDB in order to, like, see is this actually the string for that parameter that we thought it was, we can use that examine memory with the format string, like with the format specifier of s, right? So x slash s tells us to uh, go to memory there and look at it as if it were a string. So I'm going to copy that. x slash s it. Paste the address. And that's a failed bloggery. There we go. So I guess I needed to add the little... Uh, star on there again. So yeah, that's actually, because this is actually pointing at some other location memory, right? So again, just to make this quick, we have argv is a pointer to a pointer, right? This points up somewhere to this array. This array, each of these things is a pointer, right? So this is a pointer, that's a pointer, and, you know, this is argv of zero. This is argv of one, right? And each of these, though, points to some string, right? Somewhere else, and this could be, you know, the string, you know, ASCII, whatever an ASCII byte is for two, Right, so I think of it off the top of my head, but I can totally find it out. What was it telling you when you didn't put the star in front of the address? What it was telling me when I didn't put the star in front of the address is it was just literally going to. So if we said that this right here, so if this was um, BF dot 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 424, and this was BF dot dot dot. 428. All right, so the question was, you know, what was it actually explaining when I didn't put that star on there, right? It was basically just going to memory at the address that I gave it, treating that so as a sequence of ASCII characters, but it wasn't actually doing it. Like it was probably putting it in octal because that sequence is D5. Let's see if I can octal. There we go. Oh, he knows octal. Uh, yeah, so for whatever reason, it was defaulting to octal at that moment, and therefore, 
it was just saying like this is an octal 325 aka hex d5 and as a character hex d5 is like I don't think it's anything because ASCII characters are all less than 7F. So it's a non-printable character. But I can try like this C. I guess I didn't show you C and I didn't show you Octo. But what the man page is for, right? So I mean, you can't print this out as a character, for instance, which would have normally done it as like an ASCII character because it's not in the printable ASCII range. I don't know why it loves Octo right here, but pretty sure it probably has to do with the default switcher. Anyway, so when I put the star on there, right, then it's saying, like, actually dereference this. So realistically, what I should have done was, uh, you know, recognize that the next instruction was dereference EAX and put that in. That's the address of the actual string, right? So all I had done thus far is I had gotten a pointer. Uh, let's see. Right, so this gave me a pointer to this memory, right? So ending in 428, that's not my string. That's where I have the address of the pointer to the string, right? That's why the next thing is saying, take out whatever's in here and put that into EAX because that's the pointer to the string. That's the thing which points up there. So the next instruction, if I would do that without the star, it would work. By putting the star in, I like forced it to you reference it once myself. So let's execute this move from memory pointed to by EAX. Dereference this. This is an RM32 form. Dereference it. Stick it into EAX. So whereas EAX right now is pointing at this 428, we want to get the thing out of that memory and then put that in EAX. All right. So did that. Got ending in 5D5. So up here somewhere is 5D5. 5D5, that's where there's actually a sequence of characters, one at a time, ending in a null character. Right? And so if I did this now as a, as a string, if I did x slash s, and then that, right? then that's going to say, if I go to the address ending in 5DF, or 5D5, and I print one character as an ASCII string, one byte as an ASCII string, one byte as an ASCII string, and finally I hit a null terminating character, uh, then this is a string. So again, I could look at that like, you know, one character at a time if I wanted. I could say the character literally, literally at 5D5 is 2, one at 5D5, one 5D6 is 5, 7, finally 8, right? Ending in a null character. Okay, so that's my string. Anyways, so what I have in EAX right now is the value that came out of here. And that's the pointer, 5D5. Right, so this was 5D5. I took that, I put that into EAX. And what am I probably going to do with that if I want to, like, call A2I and I want to... Uh, Pass it argv of one. Matt, what do we think is coming up? What would you expect is coming up next if I'm pushing? If I'm uh, going to call the thing, right? Sorry, this is way shots. <coughs> Scrolling through some years. Okay, so I've got this value that's stored in argv of one in EAX, right? And I'm building up to a call to A2I. So what do I expect is going to happen next? Right. So you'd expect that I would do a push EAX or something to that effect, right? Not so. No. <laughs> it's, uh, yes, it is, but it's not. So this is where the weirdness of uh, GCC's um, allocation of memory comes in. So we saw before that it allocated a bunch of space that seemed like too much space, more than we needed. If we look at the next instruction, we see we, not a push EAX, we see a move EAX to memory pointed to by ESP. ESP is down here at the bottom of that big blob of memory that I allocated. Some big blob. We did ESP minus hex 20. All we know is there's some hex 20 space here, right? And now what this is telling me is take that EAX that I have, 
my BFF ending in uh, 5D5, and stick that into memory wherever ESP is currently pointing. ESP is pointing right there. So I'm going to do BFF ending in 5T5, put it right there, 4 bytes, EFF 5D5. Right? So I didn't move the stack. I didn't push anything on, right? I didn't push to make the stack pointer go down or anything like that. It's like it creates all the space it'll ever need for locals and maybe parameters that it's going to pass to function. Creates it all in one fell swoop. And then it goes ahead and anything it needs to pass to function, it puts it onto the stack here or there or there, right? And that's functionally the equivalent because once you go ahead and do that call, you know, the top of your stack is right here. And so what's going to be here next? You know, saved EIP. Right? So I call A2I. I have saved EIP, which is going to be, what's it going to be here? Anyone? What's going on the stack? Say it louder. Yep. 80483DA, right? The instruction after the call instruction. So that's 48. 3DA, dot, 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 or a 3DA. For people on the video, wait. All right. So when I do the call, right, that's going to push the same thing. We're going to treat, just like we did last time, we're going to treat A2I as some black box. I put things onto the top of the stack. I need to make sure that the top of the stack has my parameter I'm passing to it. And then I call it. And then I get back some number in EAX. So I'm going to treat this, you know, we'll say we called it. It did its thing with its stack frame. And finally, it, A2I returned. There's no more saved thing. We're back to the top of the stack being right there. And so in order to do this, I'm going to use the, uh, I'm going to use the next instruction, the next I, next instruction. So right now I, have, I haven't pushed the thing on this stack yet. So I'm going to do that first, the step I. All right, that pushes my 5D5 onto the stack, just like we showed on the picture. All right, then I'm going to next I over this call instruction. All right, and then that's going to get me to the instruction immediately after the call instruction, right? And what do I see in EAX, right? What's my output from the A2I? It's hex 100, a.k.a. that 256 decimal. All right. And then <clears throat> now it turns out, let's see. So now what are we going to do? Uh, well, what did we do with our return value from the A2I? We assigned it to A, right? A equals A2I of arg V of 1. So now we see something interesting. EAX, which is our return value, is being put into ESP plus hex 1C. Well, this entire big blob was x20, right? So x20, little math here, what's, what's, what's x20 minus 4, right? For instance, what's x20 minus 4? 1c, 12 plus 4, carry the 1, right? So ESP. ESP still points right here. This is still on the stack. And we know this went down 20, and we know we want to now go up 1C, right? And then that leaves us pointing at this right here. So it's like EBP minus 4. Well, it would have been EBP minus 4 if we hadn't had this alignment, right? So rather than doing an EBP minus something, because they don't know how much it would be EBP minus, right? I said before, until we actually saw what these literal stack values were at the time of this, we didn't know whether it was going down, whether it was staying the same. All of a sudden, now this is using ESP relative addressing rather than EBP minus, EBP plus. Okay, so ESP relative now, this is ESP plus 1C. This is our, you know, int 
A equals X 100, right? So int A is stored in memory here, sort of at the top of the local variables as we would expect. But it's not using EVP relative things, presumably because of this alignment thing that occurred and they don't know how much it's going to be aligned because they don't know, for instance, how much stack space the previous function used, right? The previous function could have been aligned and then pushed one thing onto the stack and then it's no longer aligned. So this alignment thing would you know, subtract a certain amount. So when uh, they're using that alignment sort of thing, they start using this. Yeah. So if alignment matters, why is it Windows? Alignment doesn't well, matter. I, why is Linux I can't speculate as to that. Uh, as I believe I said yesterday, lies in the workforce of compiler operators, compiler uh, programmers are unknown to me. Sometimes they'll choose to go with some guidance. Sometimes they won't. Maybe they'll have done their own performance benchmarking where they said this doesn't care. Whereas these people didn't do performance benchmarking and they just said, well, the spec says align it, so we'll do it. Right? I would guess if Windows isn't doing it, it probably doesn't actually matter to any significant degree because they do care about performance a lot. So. <coughs> Okay, so what do we see? Take an EAX, sticking it into ESP plus 1C, that's what we're going to call A, right? That's our variable A. And then immediately after that, we see another one of those silly little things where we move from ESP plus 1C immediately into EAX, right? So, but we already have that in EAX. That's what, you know, I don't care what's in e ESP plus 1C. We know that's already what was in EAX, right? So Point is, being very, rig you know, just very simplistic about it. What are we doing after the, uh, what are we doing after the assignment, right? A2I return address goes into A. Now we're going to read whatever's in A, push it onto the stack in order to call subroutine, right? Then we're going to go find argc, push that onto the stack, call subroutine, right? So it's just going to go in, I'll say, hey, I got to get A, going to go get it out of memory keeping track of the fact right now that it has it in memory already, register. So it gets it into the register and then it's going to put that to ESP plus four now. All right, so I'll, let me step through this here quick. All right, so put it into memory, get it back out into EAX. Oops. All right, so EAX X100. <coughs> uh, wait, did I go far enough? Yes, I did. Okay. EX is hex 100. And now the thing it's going to do with it is it's going to, there's an RM32 destination here. EX goes into ESP plus 4. They calculate the address ESP plus 4. ESP still points here at the bottom. Calculate that plus 4. Stick this into memory at that location. We have a destination which is memory, right? So this is ESP plus 4 right there. Take our hex 100 and put that there, right? And so we can see, right, we're not pushing stuff onto the stack, but we are kind of probably putting it in the right place, right? The second parameter goes at ESP plus four. The first parameter is probably going to go ahead and overwrite whatever's at ESP. So do that. You know, here's our stack right now. It's still down here at 3350. Still got that on the stack. I'm going to execute this next instruction. Take EAX, which is hex 100. Put it into ESP plus four. That's right there. And that should be hex 100 after I step over this. Bam. Hex 100, right? ESP plus four. All right. Now, what's the next thing doing? Well, we've got EBP plus eight. EBP plus something are the function parameters passed in. EBP still points up here. Plus eight. That's argc. That's the second thing we're passing in. All right, so you can see we're going to get that into the register EAX and then we're going to push that, we're going to take that register and write it to wherever ESP is currently pointing, right there. Go ahead and write argc, which is 2, onto ESP, right? So that's the second instruction. So first instruction, get 2 into EAX, step by. All right, EAX is 2. Next instruction, move EAX to ESP. Step I, 
Okay. The top of our stack is now two. So we've got our parameters pushed, you know, quote, pushed onto the stack because the top of the stack has our first parameter. Next, next to top of the stack has the second parameter. And now we're, you know, we're a lot, we can call subroutine. I'm not going to go into it, right? We know it goes in there. It multiplies two times. Well, okay, I will go into it because we saw that it generated different code than we saw in. All right, I'm going to step into this call instruction. That's going to put me at, you know, the start of subroutine. You can see up in the source code view right there, it says int sub x and y. Got a standard function prologue. I'm going to just step over those two quick. Step by two, all right, to get past those. All right, now what do we see? We see EBP. So, you know, just to do it quickly, you know, we're down here. We've got a saved EIP. Right, we called uh, sub, got the saved EIP. First thing it does, pushes the saved EVP. I hope this repetition is helping make it so that if called upon to make your own stack pictures, you could uh, recognize that at least there's going to be some sort of saved EIP, saved EVP kind of thing going on, essentially. All right, so anyways, EVP points here now. We're past. <clears throat> All right, so we're now in subroutine. We're accessing EBP plus eight, right? Well, EBP plus eight is always the first parameter to our function. That's two. Put two into EAX. All right, and now here's the interesting thing where they're, where they're doing things differently, right? So when we get into subroutine, in that source code view, right, this was X. This was y, right? In subroutine, it considers its parameters passed in. The first one is x. The second one is y. And what are we trying to calculate? 2 times x plus y, right? So whereas previously they did a single LEA instruction, which, right, was the LEA functionally did LEA of whatever it was, y plus x times 2, right? That's kind of what we saw before. Right, this time, no. We get to this EBP plus 8 into EAX, and then we just add EAX to itself, functionally becoming 2x, right? 2x, we got 4 there now. And then you can see EBP plus uh, C, which is the Y. Go ahead and add directly from memory. So this is an add where we're using the RM32 form. We already have 2x in EAX. And now we're saying our y is in memory at EBP plus C. Just take it directly from memory, add it into EAX, store the result in EAX. Now EAX holds 2x plus y. And then tear down. Pop EBP, except. So now I'm going to try turn from this function. We'll see if this works. Um. <clears throat> Right? So there's this finish command that I, not in your slides, but if I do the finish, this is the step out of, basically. So I'm in subroutine somewhere right now, and I want to step out, so I'm going to try finish, except a little weird sometimes. Okay, well that did step me out of subroutine, right? And it stepped me into main. Let's see if it put me to the right instruction. There's sub. Oh, okay. Here's what I know right now. It brought me back to a leave and a return in main. I'm going to do a quick x slash 10i of main. Yeah, so not quite. Let's skip the... No, no. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so if I return from that call to subroutine, right, the next instruction would be a leave. And then the next instruction would be a return. So I just stepped out of sub, and now I can go ahead, do my leave, which is, you know, right? So what is leave? It's move ESP, which is down here somewhere. Right? So when I got out of the subroutine, ESP is down here again. Move ESP to EBP. ESP, right? That, like, wipes out everything up to there. 
Eve destroys all that, and then it does pop EBP, destroys that, and we're just back to this, return, destroys that, and we are out of main. And it is the caller's job to clean up those parameters that he passed, right? We're not a standard call function. All right, so that's going through an example to in GDP, right? So the key commands are, you know, setting our breakpoints, setting our displays, things like that, right? So display, we just set all those up. You just do it once in a command file, and you're done. And then just step into or step over, right? So step into is just step I, and step over is next I. So those are the main things. And the examine memory, right? So X means go to memory at that location and treat it like a string or a character or a D word or something like that. All right. So that was going through a simple example in uh, GDB. Any questions about executing stuff in GDB? I'm sure I have more commands that I probably forgot to tell you and now we're going to go back and learn about. But any questions thus far?